Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Vicki Pretlow, a program specialist with the Office of Community Services Division of Energy Assistance. On behalf of OCS, I'd like to welcome all of you to today's webinar on providing reminders for completing the fiscal year 2019 performance data form second and third modules. Uh, that's modules two and three, also known as the performance measures. We'll hear from two speakers today, Melissa Torgerson and Dan Bausch, both of a prize. Next slide. There are two purposes for our webinar today. The first is to provide a brief refresher to modules two and three of the LIHEAP performance data form, which is also called the performance measures. Um, state grantees and the District of Columbia are required to complete this report each year as a part of the federal law heat reporting requirements. The second purpose of this webinar is to provide you with important reminders about the reporting rules for the performance measures, how the data is reviewed and validated, and the common reporting issues to check for and avoid. The main audience for this webinar includes the law heat coordinators, staff, and or contractors who have worked on performance measures in the past and need a brief refresher on the main items to remember. If you are new and have not yet worked on performance measures, this webinar will be helpful to you, but we also encourage you to download the slides from December's webinar on reviewing the report in detail. Those slides are attached to this, hand, to this uh, webinar as a handout um, as a convenience to you. I'd also like to share that an action transmittal is expected to be published soon regarding the FY 2019 LIHEAP performance data form. Uh, lastly, we hope that this training webinar is valuable to you and we appreciate the time that you're taking to participate. Uh, with that, I'll hand it over to Melissa. Good morning. Today's webinar is going to be 30 minutes long and we're going to be reviewing key information as Vicki mentioned. The slides are available for download now under the handouts uh, section of the navigation bar. Um, and the webinar is being recorded and will be published on the ACF YouTube channel. If you have questions today as we go along, we encourage you to type them into the GoToWebinar question box and we'll review and respond to those questions at the end of the webinar or via dire a direct email from a prize. So before we begin, um, we'd like to actually take questions from any of you as you've been working on module two, the performance measures form. I imagine some of you have come up with questions and so we wanna start by giving you a chance to put those out there. Um, this uh, screen kind of shows you uh, where you need to put the questions in the navigation bar. If you don't see your bar on the side of your screen, click the orange arrow and it will expand. Um, and that's also where you'll find the handout. So while you're thinking of questions, Jorge, if you could flip um, to this is the, the next slide. Um, Dan has gone ahead and typed up um, an outline as we have for the last few slide decks, um, which kind of um, gives you some key points and reminders so that if you're reviewing this slide deck after the presentation today, you can go right to the area you'd like. And so if we wanna go back to the screen and take any questions, that would be great. Hi, Melissa. We have one question. Um, mm -hmm. It says, I have a few hundred households whose fuel type I do not know. Should I exclude these households? Hi, this is Dan. Um, well, first, one, one uh, thing to target is making sure that you're collecting the main heating fuel for households uh, that, that apply for assistance and receive assistance. Um, so that is one important thing to check. Now, there definitely are situations where you wouldn't know the main heating type, such as uh, for, for renters and uh, those kinds of situations. And in the performance data form, the very first line in Section 5 is um, Part A, and that's just asking you to report on all of your households that received bill payment assistance. Uh, so some form of assistance to help pay a portion of energy expenses. You, you would want to include those households there. You could put them in the uh, other 
fuel type column and just indicate in the notes the number of households that, that you put in the other fuel type column for whom you don't know their main heating fuel. Uh, for the rest of section five, where you're reporting on their uh, main heating expenses, electricity uh, expenditures, their energy burden, um, you, you'd have to exclude them there since you don't know their main heating type and wouldn't be able to get that information. But if you have any questions, just reach out to us and we'll work to assist you. We have another question. Um, can you provide a definition of prevention and restoration and explain what is the difference between the two? Melissa, do you want to take that one first? Sure. Um, so restoration um, is looking at households who are out of fuel or already disconnected or whose equipment is inoperable. In other words, they're already in a no heat um, crisis situation. Prevention is looking at those households who are at imminent risk of a no heat situation. For example, households who are almost out of fuel, um, households who um, have a disconnect notice, or um, households who have equipment that is likely to fail in the near future at imminent risk. The imminent risk piece, the whole prevention, is a little bit um, more wiggly than the restoration definition. So uh, we have a whole supplement online that talks about the different ways states categorize um, imminent risk. Um, for example, in some states that looks like 25% um, uh, fuel tank or less. In some states that's a past due and a disconnect notice. In other states it's just the disconnect notice. Um, and then in, for equipment repair and replacement, many weatherization books have helped define what um, what a almost inoperable furnace looks like. Someone called it a kick the bucket list. Um, so there there's some flexibility in the re, in the prevention definitions, not so much in the restoration. Dan, do you want to add to that? No, I I think that's really good and. Um... In that step-by-step -step webinar that's attached as a handout, there's a, a whole section on restoration, a whole section on prevention that helps to kind of lay out uh, the differences and, and where you could be able to kn uh, know how to categorize a certain situation. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. We don't have any other questions. Okay. Right. Well, so we, we already gave this outline. So um, you know, this is something that's really useful, and I'm going to go ahead and turn it back over to Dan. Uh, okay, so uh, as an overview, the LIHEAP performance data form is, a, is an annual report um, that all state grantees in the District of Columbia submit to HHS. If you were on um, the prior webinar on the grantee survey, we, we also uh, talked about this. Module two is are the are the required performance measures. Uh, data. Uh, this this information is very important because it allows uh, OCS to report information to Congress that really gets at LIHEAP impacts, um, looking beyond how much in funding was allocated to a certain use or how many households received a benefit. Module 2 helps to talk about how that uh, amount of funding and how that uh, benefit helped impact households. Um, either by restoring service, preventing the loss, or by reducing energy burden. Optional three is also dealing with performance measures, but that is an optional module that's uh, been provided by OCS uh, to help grantees that might be interested in looking in more detail at performance impacts. Um, so if you're curious about that module, it, it would encourage you to look at it and reach out with any questions. Um, now, the good news is there are no changes to the FY19 performance data form from last year's 2018 performance data form. So there's no new required data elements. The form has not changed in its structure or layout. Um, so you should be able to follow the instructions from last year's performance data form uh, and use the same approaches you used last uh, for last year's report to report on the fiscal year 2019. 
uh, performance data form. And at the bottom of this slide, there is a link to the FY18 performance data form action transmittal and instructions. As uh, Vicky mentioned, uh, OCS is working to publish an action transmittal for fiscal year 2019. Now we're going to talk about some of the main uh, reporting rules for Module 2. So just an overview and quick reminder, grantees should be collecting main heating fuel bill information and electricity bill information from a sample of their energy vendors. Um, and this is, um, if you remember, the top five electric and natural gas vendors and the top 10 propane oil um, and other fuel vendors. We um, expect that you'll be calculating all of your statistics and collecting information according to the official instructions that Dan just pointed out. And as with all of these reports, any time that there are unique program features or nuances or you're um, struggling with data quality, um, taking some time to explain that in the notes section will go a long way when your reports are reviewed as well as um, when your reports are put in the report to Congress, your data, we can um, explain any discrepancies or nuances. And next we'll go to data validation and checks. Uh, in, in the OLDC system that you use to submit your performance data form, there are some built-in validation checks to assist you in completing your report and in alerting you to any possible uh, issues or possible items that might need more explanation in the notes. Um, there are two types of messages you can receive in OLDC. Warning messages uh, alert you that there's an item that may require additional ex explanation or something you may need to check uh, because it's uh, unusual or is a large change from uh, the report you submitted previously for the prior fiscal year. Uh, and then there's fatal error messages. Those messages tell you that there's some data that's inconsistent and needs to be corrected before you're able to submit your report. For module two, there are not uh, many, many of these messages that will appear, um, but we do check your report once it is submitted. Uh, we conduct a, a review of each uh, state grantee's report and we work to identify any potential issues. So once you do submit your report, uh, we'll reach out to you with any questions. Then when your report is confirmed as complete, your liaison accepts it in OLDC. Uh, but if you later would like to make a correction or a change, you can do so by submitting a revision in OLDC. Now we're going to look at some of the uh, common reporting issues and reminders for how to uh, avoid them. Um, so the first common issue that we see is, is calculating weighting aver weighted averages in the all households column. In the performance data form for section five, which is energy burden targeting, you're asked to report information by uh, main heating type. So you, you report different statistics for electricity main heating type households, the same statistics for natural gas heat households, and so on. Uh, but on the left-hand side, there's a column called the All Households column, and that column is intended as the as the overall average across all fuel types. Um, one thing that we uh, that we see many grantees do initially is uh, kind of add together the values for electricity and natural gas and the other fuel types, and uh, do a simple average where you divide it by five for the five fuel types. But because each fuel type uh, has a different number of households in it, the average actually needs to be a weighted average. So we have created this document that you can see linked in the third bullet down that talks about how to do this. But we've also, we also have two main options that we wanted to tell you about to make sure you correctly calculate the averages for the all households column. Um, option number one is we have an Excel form uh, that automatically calculates the all households weighted averages. It looks exactly like the form in OLDC, and it's a, a useful way to 
input your information and get the correct all households values. Um, so the link to it is in these webinar slides. Option two is you can calculate the averages directly in your data system um, by including all households irregardless of, uh, or regardless of fuel type and calculating the averages. If you need any more explanation on how to do that or any assistance, you can um, reach out to Melissa or, or Jorge or anyone at the Apprise team and we can give you more information on doing that. So when we, we just talked about prevention and restoration uh, data a little bit, um, but sections um, six and seven of the report should include the total number of occurrences where LIHEAP assistant restored household energy service, and then section seven looks at the total number of occurrences where LIHEAP assistance prevented the loss of home energy service. Once again, if you need help with those definitions, reach out. We have a supplement online, but we're also willing to talk to you about how to best count those. This is one area of LIHEAP reporting where we're not asking you to do an unduplicated count. The number of occurrences really looks at um, each time a household comes in and receives a service that either restores or prevents um, home energy loss. And so um, we know that people will co may come in once, you know, for a regular heating assistance grant, and that may restore service. And someone may come in again for um, crisis assistance that restores service. And so both of those would be counted and that would be counted twice. The number of occurrences should reflect all types of LIHEAP assistance as well. Um, so for example, some people um, kind of instinctively want to just count crisis assistance in the restoration and prevention categories. But um, truth be told, we know that oftentimes a regular or standard grant can be enough to prevent service from being disconnected or can even restore service that's already been disconnected. So you should be counting any type of assistance, uh, bill payment assistance um, that helps to restore or um, prevent energy service uh, loss. Um, we also um, want to remind you that when you're looking at equipment repair and replacement in each of these sections, you should also be capturing LIHEAP weatherization dollars used to um, fix inoperable or replace inoperable equipment um, or equipment that's on its last leg. So um, once again, there's a supplement on this. Um, this is some of the easier data actually to capture out of all of this, but it can be a little bit confusing, especially if you're new. So go ahead and reach out if you need additional assistance. Uh, the third reminder is that for the performance data form, um, there is a specific definition you're asked to use for reporting on high burden, high burden households. Uh, for the performance measures, high burden households are the top 25% that receive bill payment assistance and that you're able to include in Part B of Section 5 based on those households having the highest calculated energy burden. Um, you may use another definition in, in your state for what counts as high burden, uh, but OCS has asked for the performance measures that uh, all state grantees use that same definition of the top 25% uh, for consistency. So now we're going to look at the five steps to correctly do this. Um, on the bottom of this slide, you'll see a, a table of uh, example data. The first step is that you want to take each household that you're including in Part B of Section 5, and you're going to want to add together each household's main heating bill and their electricity bill. You can see those in the middle columns. So for example, Household 1, the main heat is propane. Their annual heating bill, their propane bill, is $2,800. You also to include them in Section 5, you also need to capture their electricity bill data from their uh, electricity utility vendor. And households one, Household 1 has an annual electricity bill of $1,200. When you add those two amounts together, the annual total residential energy bill is $4,000. So step one is to do that for all households. 
if you see down at household three, if a household's main heat is electricity, uh, then there's only one bill, their electricity bill. Uh, so the total in the right-hand column for household three is $1,200 uh, based on that electricity bill. So once you've figured out each household's total uh, residential energy bill, their main heating bill plus their electricity bill, the next step is you use that with the income information you have on that household to calculate their energy burden. Uh, and you can see the formula there for how to do that. The third step is you may have some households who have a calculated energy burden that is above 100%. Uh, that, could be, that could be a situation where you have households with zero income or very low income so that their energy bill actually exceeds their income. And for those households, you need to um, replace their energy burden amount with 100%. For step four, you'd sort, uh, your, sort all the households that you have from highest to lowest based on that calculated energy burden. And finally, the last step is once you have them sorted from highest to lowest, you would take the top 25% of households, and those would be the high burden households. You do that regardless of fuel type, um, so you don't have to take 25% of fuel oil households, 25% of natural gas households. You just include all households together, sort from highest to lowest, and include the top 25%. Um, if, if you have any questions about doing that, we would encourage you to, to reach out to us again. This slide is kind of a overall picture of those five steps. Um, so would encourage you to take some time to look through this. If you have any um, questions about it, just let us know. Okay, now we're gonna look at some final reminders. All right, as Dan mentioned earlier in the webinar, there are no changes to the 2019 uh, performance data form. The requirements remain the same as uh, last year. The performance data form for FY 2019 is due in OLDC on January 31st, 2020. This includes module one, the grantee survey, um, module two performance measures, and if you're going to turn in optional performance measures, this is also the time to do it. Keep in mind that the performance data form has to be entered, saved, and certified and submitted in OLDC, which can take some time. So if you're a procrastinator, um, make sure you're giving yourself enough time to take those steps once your report is completed. There are OLDC resources. We, do, um, we don't give a lot of OLDC guidance on these webinars, but there are a lot of resources available for those of you who might be new to it. Um, right uh, here is the login for OLDC, and we've also given you help desk information, both the phone number and the email here. If you're having issues getting through to folks or you need additional assistance, don't hesitate to reach out to your liaison or to us at a price. And here are your liaisons, uh, link to all the liaisons numbers, um, so you'll be able to find out if you haven't already spoken with your liaison or know who it is, this is where you find out. We've uh, included the OLDC information again, as well as uh, phone numbers and emails for those of us on the APRISE team who are available to assist you with anything you might need when it comes to LIHEAP reporting. We're gonna go ahead and uh, take questions. Once again, this is the um, method you use. You go ahead and type in a question. If the sidebar is minimized and you can't see that question box, go ahead and click the orange arrow and that will expand your navigation bar so you can do that. Hi, uh, we have a couple of questions. Uh, so the first question reads, in my state, we calculate the average energy bill for households of each fuel type. Then we calculate a weighted average to get the amount that goes in the all households column. When we do this, should we include electricity households in the denominator? Uh, hi, this is Dan. Um, I think a simple way to think about it is 
when you are working with that all households column, you want to make sure that all households are included in the average amount. So if a household uh, is natural gas main heat or electricity main heat, any of the fuel types, you would want to be including it in that average amount. Um, so in that case, in the denominator. Um, so the answer is is yes. Um, if if you want a simple way to do it, uh, we do have that spreadsheet, and now it's actually in the handouts as part of this webinar. So you'll see it uh, on the right hand side of your screen, the the little green um, Excel icon. You can enter in your information, and it'll calculate it for you. The next question is. If a household was excluded from Part B and C because we didn't get their data from the vendors, do we have to include it in the prevention and restoration sections? That is a really good question. Um, for the performance data form, Section 5 is all about households that receive bill payment assistance and that you've collected data for from um, from the energy vendors that you have that you targeted to collect data from and um, OCS in the instructions has stated that each each state grantee you're not required to target all of your vendors but just a sample of vendors the prevention uh, section and the restoration section are not related to which energy vendors you collected data from. They're, they're meant to uh, cover all uh, forms of LIHEAP assistance, and you should include any household where there was an instance that LIHEAP helped restore home energy service or prevent the loss of home energy service. For many states, that's uh, primarily households that receive crisis assistance. But it can also be households that received regular non-crisis assistance if it uh, restored lost service or prevented the loss of service. Um, so those supplements Melissa talked about describe that process. And um, we'd be happy to help talk, it, talk, talk you through it if, um, if you have questions or you're not quite sure if the way you're reporting on prevention and restoration uh, is, is correct or, or needs to be changed. One more question. Uh, last year, a price found that we had not identified high burden households correctly. What are some ways that I can check my data this year to make sure that my report is correct? There are a few easy ways that you can check that. Um, the first is that whatever number of households that you report in Section B, the number you report in Section C should be 25% of that number. So that's an easy check to make sure that the correct amount of households are being identified as, as high burden in Section C. Another check is the high burden households are selected based on those households having the highest energy burden. And in both Section, uh, section B or Part B and Part C, you're asked to report on annual income and annual main heating expenses, as well as annual electricity expenses. And the performance data form calculates the average energy burdens um, by fuel type using that information. And so if you see in part B, your energy burden is actually higher than in Part C, that, that would be an indication of a problem as well. You should see the households in C having higher energy burdens than in Part B. So there, those are two um, easy checks you can do. I'd also encourage you to look at the check before you submit document. That's a handout on this webinar that also has some information on how you can look at Section C and make sure that um, the households that are included there are correct. Okay, we have no more questions, so uh, we can move on to the poll. All right, before you all leave, we'd really appreciate if you'd take just a couple of seconds to answer a poll question. 
And the question is, how confident are you that you understand how to correctly complete module two of the performance data form, which is the performance measures? And the options here are very confident, somewhat confident, not too confident, and not at all confident. Okay, so we have some um, results initially. 63% um, of you are very confident, that's fantastic. 31 are somewhat, and 6% are not too confident. So for those of you who are in those last two categories, we encourage you to reach out when you have questions. Um, don't spend a lot of time trying to figure it out on your own. Just give us a call, we're happy to walk you through and um, help with whatever um, you might need. We appreciate your time today, Dan and Jorge. Is there anything else you'd like to add? No, thank you so much for your, your time and your questions. And um, we look forward to speaking with you if, if you have any feedback or questions. Have a great day. Have a good day. Bye-bye.